The United Nations is toothless and useless in this situation, 100%. Invasi Rusia ke Ukraina menjadi serangan yang terbesar di Eropa sejak Perang Dunia Kedua. Jutaan orang mengungsi, kota hancur, dan berbagai dampak lainnya. Kami berkesempatan berbincang dengan Duta Besar Ukraina, Fasil Hamiyamin, soal konflik dengan Rusia, gejolak politik, dan apa yang bisa dilakukan ke depan. Selamat siang, Mbak Loren. Kami dari Narasi. Kami udah janjian interview dengan Bapak Duta Besar. Ukraine calls this attack an invasion, but it's special military operation for Russia. How do you see this? Colonial systems, the empires, they don't use the truth to deliver the information or to in talking with anyone, because the truth is something they are very afraid of. Like it was in communist Soviet Union, like it was in older Russian empire, like it is now. So <clears throat> whatever they say, you have to filter and to analyze what it is. Military operation is something in the wording to distract attention of the world community from what is happening in reality. And they deliver a lot of news like this with one purpose, to distract attention, to lead it somewhere to the, you know, far away from what's happening in fact. And uh, I would say it, uh, if, I, if you ask me about the scale of what is happening, it's, uh, it's not even a war of Russia against Ukraine. It's not just invasion of Russia to Ukraine. It's a war of neo-colonialism against the democracy. And if it's not stopped right now, it will endanger the whole world. It's, uh, I mean, it was proved by the Second World War, it was proved by the First World War, it was proved by many wars, in even smaller wars and uh, so-called local conflicts in, uh, in the 20th century and, and later. It was proved even by the, by the genocide of Russian, uh, Russian government against the, its own people. In so its own Chechen people against Muslim population, and during 10 years it was like lasted like nearly 10 years. So, the uh, military operation is something if you mean it, right? It's a uh, like military activities against the military uh, army, uh, the army of military troops of the enemy somewhere, right? But it would never include the intentional and massive killing of civilians. And it would never include the attacks, intentional attacks of the civilian objects, like schools and hospitals and residential houses. I mean, it's not like a mistake, you dropped a bomb somewhere and just uh, destroyed a house. No, it's, uh, we have thousands of objects destroyed. And President Vladimir Putin has long claimed that Ukraine belongs to Russia. And just like what you've mentioned earlier, brothers, that you are one people. What is your thought about this? <clears throat> the history of Russian-Ukrainian relations in fact, during the last 300 years, was the history of uh, liberation wars of Ukrainian people against the Russian colonialism. That was, has been happening for 300 plus years. And uh, repeatedly there were revolts, there were wars, there were uh, like uh, guerrilla wars, there were resistance from the people during decades and centuries. So uh, the, we, we, we never perceived them as brothers, honestly. Uh, it was on the level of ideology. Uh, ideologically, they say, yeah, uh, this and this. But you don't do anything like this to brothers, never in, in your life, right? So, so they think about new shapes of propaganda, new lies, in terms of, they say, we don't have a war with Ukrainian people because they are brothers. We are not fighting with Ukraine, but we are fighting with the sort of government of Ukraine, <coughs> like military, Nazi, whatever they, they think, whatever they lie. Um, and uh, Putin's utmost purpose is Ukraine. He's not, he's not afraid of NATO. He's not afraid of uh, like missiles and nuclear whatever. He's not afraid of anything. And his purpose is to have Ukraine back in this empire, in this, uh, in this whatever he calls it, Soviet Union or Federation or empire or something. It's his dream. It has been his dream for, for, for many years. He, he just uh, dreaming to restore the Soviet Union, as he claimed many times. So, for him, the collapse of uh, USSR was the catastrophe, the biggest catastrophe, geopolitical catastrophe. All the 20th century, I repeat, not the wars, not not the genocide, collapse of the Soviet Union. So, this is this explains a lot. Without Ukraine, as as many analysts, uh, like many many years ago, has already explained, without Ukraine, there would not be a possibility, a chance to restore the Great Russian Empire. So that's why he wanted so badly. 
and you've said earlier about the purpose of Putin's aggression towards Ukraine. He also said that he wants to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. But on the other hand, we know that President Volodymyr Zelensky is a Jewish who signed a law combating anti-Semitism. How do you see this? So the denazification, demilitarization is an excuse of Vladimir Putin, not even to the world community because nobody trusts him, but to the Russian people to justify this war. But again, I repeat, it's uh, something, actually we can replace all the interview with one phrase. Uh, nothing can justify the aggression and the uh, murders of civilians. Nothing can justify this. And that claims only a justification for Putin to invade Ukraine. Absolutely. But I, 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 think, I think it's like we have to understand. Nothing can justify this. Nothing. Not his dreams, not his bad health, not his, uh, like, uh, what, he, what he's afraid of, not his phantoms of his, you know, of his imagination, nothing. And uh, even if you look at the map, right, you look at Russia, you look at Ukraine, you look at the population, you look at the army, we are like times and times and times smaller. So what kind of threat can they feel from Ukraine to justify this aggression or this case? So will Ukraine join NATO if there is a chance? Ukraine will join NATO if, if first, we're giving the response from NATO that they are ready to accept us eventually, they give us the plan of joining NATO, and if the people of Ukraine would support this decision of Ukraine, of Ukrainian government. So now it is in our constitution. We are moving towards the uh, European Union and towards NATO, right? It, it's in constitution. So it was referendum, it was approved by the parliament, and signed by the president, it's fine. So now, now what? Uh, if we decide not to join NATO, it should be a referendum of the people. People will say something, right? If they say no, we just go to the parliament. Parliament would uh, just cancel this article in the constitution. That's what's going to happen. But this will need a process, and we, as democratic, a really truly democratic state, we need a people to vote for something or against something, right? So, as simple as this. Do you believe that you will win against much greater force? You know, uh, it's not my belief uh, or something. I, I believe in my nation. But, and everybody perception was that Ukrainians was just like warm and soft and mild and uh, things like that. But yes, they are. They can even be like uh, mocked and uh, okay, they're not, 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 not uh, getting angry, don't getting angry, all that. But when the enemy comes, Ukrainians always fight back. I mean, you can defeat the army, mm -hmm. it's okay, it happens, but you cannot defeat the nation because we have like what, like 40 million of population, out of this half, half, we have like around, uh, as far as I know statistically is uh, around 6 million of uh, grown up men who is ready to fight. Uh, can you fight with your 2,100 or 3,100? I'm um, against the six million of people ready to die. In the media, in the social media, you know, the information has been like massive and overlapping. You know, in every second there's updates about the invasion, the Russian invasion th towards Ukraine. Do you think that beyond the war that's happening on the ground, there's also a war that's taking place on the internet? Yes, sure. It's a, we call it hybrid war and it, it's been happening against Ukraine for not even last eight years, but for longer, longer time, long time. At first it was like hybrid attacks on our uh, consciousness that's uh, telling again telling that we are one nation we are brothers we are, we blah 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 then after the uh, invasion to Donbass and to Crimea mm -hmm. in 2014 they started new narratives of the uh, genocide of uh, Ukraine against Donbass people and genocide of Ukraine against Crimea Russian speaking population and uh, uh, this is n narrative because uh, uh, the fact tells us that I mean the millions of people fled from Donbass and Crimea to Ukraine, not to Russia. So are they afraid of Nazis here? Like, I mean, it's an obvious fact. And the fact that, again, that uh, during the late eight years, Ukraine applied 11 times to the United Nations for the peacekeeping troops, 11 times rejected by Russian Federation. So who is uh, the, 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 who's telling the truth, right? If we are doing something uh, illegal there on the territory is like killing people or something. Would we apply like 11 times for peacekeepers and observers from UN to go to this region? Never. And why they reject? I don't know. And you've touched on that already um, about the Indonesian public that continues to favor Russia. Yeah. Even there's an academic also who supports the Russian position. What do you think of this attitude? 
I think that the attitude is, uh, it, it is very simple actually, because uh, people are inclined to believe what are they told if it looks like the truth. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's again, it's the uh, results of Russian propaganda which is efficient. But propaganda is never based on the truth. Because in this situation we just, you know, news delivery. And propaganda is something which is based on lies. It's easy. I, I give you an, uh, an example I just think about. Um, you have the lake of truth with the crystal clean water. Okay. And then you have the minyaktanahu, the, the oil, spoiled just a bit, spoiled on the surface. So surface will be covered with this film, very thin, but ugly, like brown, brownish and uh, mm -hmm. uh, blackish. And if you look from outside, yeah. you will see the black, the, the ugly black color or, or this brownish, right? You don't know what's beneath. You don't know the truth, clear and, and good, is all beneath. It's, yeah. But you have to, what, tube to blow on the surface and this film will be destroyed. Actually, President Jokowi has called for a ceasefire, right? And Indonesia also voted in favor uh, of the UN General Assembly condemning the Russian aggression. But I feel like you're still not that satisfied um, with the support from Indonesia. Is it still not enough? <coughs> If you allow me, I would not give the direct answer to this. I just uh, give you the context, uh, and you will understand what I mean. Now, uh, first, we don't have time for long diplomatic efforts. We don't have months. Second, United Nations is toothless and useless in this situation, 100%. You may approve hundreds of resolutions unanimously against the aggression, but what is the next? Next, the practical steps mu must come. For example, peacekeeping forces mm -hmm. to go to Ukraine and to cover the sky, to close the sky for uh, Russian missiles or something. But aggressor is the permanent member of the Security Council of the United Nations. I think that we need a new format, very fast one and very efficient one, to make the nego peace negotiations, peace talks, start and finish within a very short period of time. So it could be a principally new platform, or we can use one of the platforms which would not include the veto right of the Russian Federation in the United Nations. And uh, for example, we can use G20. I, just my thought. G20 is a good platform because it's, it just includes the leaders of the world, the global forces, the global nations. And Indonesia is the leader of the global nations now. I mean, it's a leader in G20 and it's becoming the global force. And yeah, um, you said that you need peace. Ukraine needs peace, wants peace. And there's been rounds of talks between Ukraine and Russia. And is it like close to agreement, the peace deal? Mm, I don't th think so. Because uh, you know what? Uh, main thing is here, we, we should certainly need peace. We didn't attack anyone, right? So obviously we are not the ones who didn't want peace, right? Uh, we were attacked and uh, of course we need peace for, and for our land. But the thing is, it, the peace doesn't come for any price at all. If you talk about peace uh, for, 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 for an exchange of losing independence, no. If we talk about the peace for the price of the Crimean Peninsula, which is home to our Muslim brothers and sisters, for two millions of them, no. If we talk about the peace of, uh, on the price of Donbass and uh, Luhansk regions, no, because we know who are suffering there, of Russian occupation. We know this very clearly, and that's why we invited peacekeepers there. So we're not trading by our land, we're not trading by our people, we are not trading by our sisters and brothers. So the, our only condition now for a peace talks to start immediately is stop killing civilians, stop bombing these cities, and just give the excess of the humanitarian uh, convoys to the cities which are now blocked and uh, surrounded, like Mariupol. The next thing we know, there's a refugee crisis, and wars caused the refugee crisis. Mm -hmm. According to the UN, more than 3 million people have fled from Ukraine. How is the Ukrainian government going to act on this? Um, I, I don't know why you call this crisis. It's uh, just the situations with the refugees. It's uh, unfortunately for the war, for the country, country uh, in the war, state of war. It's uh, like natural process, not normal, yeah, but it's natural. People fled and it's, uh, the majority of them are like women, children and elders. And uh, you know that out of three million people fled from Ukraine to the European countries. Now they have reported some sort of half million people of, uh, came back. Uh, I mean the, the, the men who was ready to fight. 
So they went to the safe place and then came back. What nation is this? Yeah. So the crisis, uh, if you talk about the crisis, it might be in terms that it's really like uh, it will be more people and uh, they should be accommodated somewhere in Europe, right? So they should be like given, given uh, shelter maybe and then something. But I think that Europe is, uh, uh, has ex some experience in this and they have, uh, uh, they have support of the population of Europe. Of Europe. So they got, no, it's not only governments of Europe that do this, but population too. And uh, eventually they will, accom will be accommodated and uh, given a job to do maybe because you might know before the war, before this uh, 2014, before the COVID, right? We had like a few millions of Ukrainians permanently working in Europe. So it's just like, you know, they came back and then went there and they go on working. So temporarily though, but uh, uh, Europe is uh, really like, uh, like capable of accommodating them. And it's very important. I'm grateful to European uh, countries, to European people that they do this now for us. Um, from the 2019 Ukrainian presidential election until President Zelensky became the leader of Ukraine, he positioned himself as someone who would clean, clean up the politics of Ukraine from oligarchs. However, he, he was allegedly linked to Ukrainian oligarch Ihor Kolomoisky, a billionaire whose TV chan channel aired his shows. And he also railed against politicians like Petro Poroshenko who hid their assets offshore. But Pandora Papers revealed that President Zelensky had a business connection to Russia via Maltex and offshore companies. What's your thought or how do you see this? I think that uh, President Zelensky uh, has been the enemy of Russian Federation number one for, for already three years, uh, from the first day. Uh, you know what? I would not dig the, uh, again, dig the uh, uh, information provided by Russian propaganda or whoever it is about the whatever uh, shares in whatever companies, because this is again distracting the atten attention from the war in Ukraine. 